Et en tout cas, il y a une zone de production en termes de séquence, de génome, d'assemblage, qui est une contribution qui est essentielle dans la connaissance de la taille du cercle. Très content qu'il ait pu trouver l'occasion de venir ici. Thank you. So, good morning. I'm afraid I won't speak in English, so I'll try to come slowly. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is how we're using um, high throughput sequencing to look at um, transmission and uh, evolution of uh, bacterial pathogens. Um, and I think the first, first thing is to get the computer work. Ah, okay. So the first thing to understand, and of course you all know this, is that there are a lot of different pressures, a lot of different factors that affect a bacterial genome. Um, and those range from uh, random mutation, uh, homologous DNA exchange, so exchanging the same genes with other members of the same species, um, acquisition and loss of genes, so mobile elements, new genes that are coming in and out of the chromosome, um, genetic drift, um, and Darwinian selection. Uh, and the important thing to realize is that the impact of each of those processes varies over time. They will, each of them will, uh, will, be very, will vary differently. So at some time scales, um, some factors will be more important, and at other time scales, other factors will be more important. And so that means that if you want to separate out, if you want to understand what are the processes of selection, what's under selection on the chromosome, um, or if you want to understand how bacteria are related and they're, therefore work out how they're transmitted, you need to separate out all of those different signatures. You can't just take the whole genome, treat the whole genome as a single entity and expect to understand any processes that are going on. You need to separate out the processes uh, independently. So, <coughs> so to illustrate this, I'm going to start with, with random mutation. Um, and this data set is, uh, was published a few years ago now, and it was the first data set we generated with the new high throughput sequencing technologies, where we suddenly sequence large numbers of bacteria at the same time. So up until um, three or four years ago, it, it was expensive and difficult to sequence one genome. And then with new machines and new technologies, we could sequence hundreds of genomes or tens of genomes at a time. And this is the first data set we used. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's from Staphylococcus aureus. And crucially, it's a single sequence type of Staph aureus, um, SC239. Now, when I say a single sequence type, that means that by standard typing technologies, by MLST, all of these strains are identical. There is no, no variation that can be detected with normal typing technologies. So we sequenced 63 of these genomes uh, just to see how much variation. We wanted to know, is there any variation? And when we started this project three years ago, this is a serious question we asked ourselves. We said, this is a set of genomes that are identical by typing. Is there any variation that we can detect underneath that? And we were really quite surprised to discover that there's a huge amount of variation um, under this. So within a single, apparently identical set of genomes, we found 6,500 total SNPs. Um, each, of these, each of these horizontal lines is one genome. Each red tip is a single SNP. The black bar at the top represents sequences that are present in all of the, gen in all of the genomes. So you can see, even here, that there are sequences that are present and absent. And this one's a bacteriophage, an integrated bacteriophage, and some, not others. So you can see that there's a lot of genetic variation, a lot of SNP variation, a lot of gene presence and absence, even in genomes that look, by standard typing techniques, to be identical. So the question is, are these SNPs random? Is there selection? Um, <coughs> can we see it? We're interested. In, in trying to work out whether, um, whether we can identify, firstly, any signatures of selection. Can we see if there's any selective processes going on? And that's important because you know, these are human pathogens. We want to know if they're, um, if, you know, if, if they're responding to the <coughs> immune system, if they're responding to antibiotics or vaccines. We want to be able to detect those signatures of selection. Um, so firstly, if you just look, just 
you look at that and you can see that the, the, the SNPs are random right across the genome. They look random. Now, I don't expect you to believe me just from they look random. Um, so we can do some statistics. And this is a, a plot of the number of SNPs per gene in that set of 63 genomes versus the frequency. So around 850 genes have no variance at all across that. So even with 4,500 SNPs, most of the genome is not varying at all. Um, but the number of SNPs per gene drops off very, very rapidly um, and in an almost perfect Poisson distribution. So if you plot that, this is a log scale, you can see pretty much a linear, um, a linear drop off in SNPs per gene. And that says that the, 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 the SNPs per gene, the distribution of SNPs across the genome is effectively random. Um, <coughs> so the second question is, um, is there evidence of selection on these? Well, go back a step. Um, because these SNPs are effectively random, we can um, identify a clock rate, a rate of acquisition of these SNPs um, that is not affected by selective processes and not affected by position of the genome. And we can get an estimate of the rate of change in the genome. And you can see, you can see again, if you plot the date of isolation versus the distance the number of SNPs from the root of a, a phylogenetic tree, I'll show you the tree in a minute, but you put these strains on a phylogenetic tree, look at the number of variants from the root from the common ancestor, and plot it against the date of isolation, you can get a, a straight line. This is another thing that we, we really couldn't do more than three or four years ago. Most bacteria, we have no historical record. We're <coughs> doing looking at the evolution of eukaryotes, looking at the evolution of humans or ferns, then you have, a, you have a fossil record, you have historical dates that you can anchor your changes to. With bacteria, we have no fossil record, we have no historical dates, and therefore our estimates of mutation rate are very, very inaccurate. This is the first time that, um, that you can really measure the rate of change, and the reason we can measure that is because this group, the 60, group of 63 genomes, shared a common ancestor probably only 40 years ago. And we have isolates across the majority of that time scale. So they've been acquiring change over just 40 or so years since they had a common ancestor, and we have isolates across almost all of that time scale. And that means we can really accurately measure the rate of change in the genome. Um, so we get a nice straight line for uh, acquisition of SNPs, all SNPs, versus <coughs> data of isolation. And it gives us a mutation rate of around three times 10 to the minus six per site per year. Um, which is about six, G, six mutations per genome per year. Now, the previous estimates we had of mutation rates in bacteria were mostly taken from a comparison of E. coli and salmonella. Um, and the, the estimates from other measures were that E. coli and salmonella separated maybe 100, 140 million years ago. And looking at the um, rate of change at the third position, at synonymous changes in the third position of the codon, we could estimate a mutation rate. The mutation rate that was estimated in that way for E. coli and salmonella was around <coughs> 10 to the minus 9 per site per year, so about a thousand times slower. Um, and we've now done this on a, a number of different organisms, including um, other enterobacteriaceae, salmonella, E. coli, uh, other salmonellas, and other staphylococci, and streptococci. And we get estimates that are very close to this most of the time. So it appears that the accepted rate of mutation in bacterial genomes um, is a thousandfold too slow. Um, and the reason for that is that it makes what the, the, the calculation of the mutation rate based on, you'll see in the textbooks, based on this count, uh, difference between salmonella and E. coli, is based on the assumption that third position changes are neutral, that um, synonymous changes in the codon are neutral. And of course, that's not true. We know that's not true. If you look at the E. coli genome, you see large numbers of biases. You see um, codon biases, tRNA selection biases, GC utilization biases, um, a huge number of biases that affect the chromosome, all of which act on the third position. And if you can see them in the chromosome, then they must have been selected for. So selection does act at the third position. It acts more slowly, but it does act over very long time periods. And the difference you see between this estimate of mutation rate, the effectively instantaneous mutation rate, and the fixation rate over 100 million years at the third position 
is that three orders of magnitude, that thousandfold difference, that is a signature of selection in the third position. <coughs> so if we wanted to look for selection occurring in these SNPs, so we've got four and a half thousand SNPs in the core genome, we want to know if, are any of them under selection or are, or are they neutral. The first thing that you normally do is, um, is measure this, this ratio DMDS, the ratio of non-synonymous changes to synonymous changes. And if there's more non-synonymous changes than synonymous changes, more codon-changing changes than changes in the DNA to keep the codon the same, you assume that there's some form of positive selection going on. And if the DNDS is very low, if there's more synonymous changes, you assume that there's, um, there's purifying selection acting. But if you look across this, this set of genomes, you see the DNDS is very high, which might suggest positive selection. Oops. <coughs> Now this graph is measuring that DNDS across the genome for every pairwise combination of those 63 genomes. Um, and it's plotting the DNDS here, uh, which you can't read, but this is DNDS here, versus the distance between each pair of genomes in terms of synonymous SNPs per site. So you can assume that this is a measure of time, distance between each pair of genomes, uh, and this is a DNDS. And what you see is as the, as the genomes get closer and closer together, the DNDS becomes one. And what that means is that as these SNPs arise in the genome, there is no selection occurring. The, the synonymous changes occur just as frequently as non-synonymous changes um, as they occur in the genome. And then over time, the synonymous changes, the non-synonymous changes start to be purified out of the population, and that's why this graph drops away. So synonymous changes are not instantaneously selected against. There's very little instantaneous selection going on. Selection takes time. And this graph, this drop-off, is a measure of selection acting at synonymous changes. And then at a longer time period, selection will start to act at, uh, selection will start to act at synonymous changes, at third position changes as well. So selection, very little selection occurring immediately. The SNPs as they arise are effectively neutral. Synon and non-synonymous changes are purified out by selection over time, by purified selection, and then subsequently selection starts to act at non-synonymous at synonymous changes. So this means that you can't use those standard measures of ratios of non-synonymous and synonymous changes to try and infer selection, because as the, as the mutations occur, selection is not, it's not acting. Um, so most of those four and a half thousand SNPs are random noise. So how do you pick out the interesting bits of selection that must be going on from that background of random noise? One way is to, is to use the structure of the tree. So this is a, a phylogenetic tree that's built from those 63 genomes. Um, and virtually all of the 63, uh, of the four and a half thousand SNPs fit the same tree. Um, and that means, again, that the SNPs are occurring randomly. They're occurring randomly, and they're getting fixed in different branches as the branches separate on the tree. Um, and, 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 and there's very little evidence of, 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 of SNPs occurring independently. Because we've now got this tree, and because most of the SNPs fit the tree, we can look for the occasional SNP that doesn't fit the tree. So if we find the same SNP occurring randomly here and here, then that's very unlikely to have happened by chance. We've seen that most genes have no SNPs at all, um, that, 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 that the SNPs are occurring effectively randomly across the chromosome. Therefore, if you see the same SNP arising independently, it's almost certainly under selection. Um, there are actually 38 SNPs out of the 4,500 that don't fit the tree. And of those 38 SNPs, 11 of them are known changes associated with drug resistance. So where selection is acting on the chromosome, it acts very rapidly and you can see it happening. Um, you can see it happening by looking for independent mutations arising in separate parts of the tree. Um, so the, the, other, the other 27 mutations are probably uh, important as well. If we look at where these SNPs are occurring in the chromosome, this is all 38 SNPs. The drug resistance ones are marked down in yellow. What you can see is that there are clusters of SNPs. Here, for example, you've got two SNPs that are associated with trimethoprim resistance. And then within 20 or 30 bases or so, or a few hundred bases, you've got other SNPs that are synonymous changes and probably not under selection, but are linked. So that's probably the signature of recombination. 
selections, uh, the, the drug resistant SNP has arisen on one branch, has been transferred to another branch for a recombination. But the other SNPs are probably point mutations. So we can use this method to go and look for um, evidence of recent selection in other trees. Um, this is uh, 59 isolates of Mycobacterium tuberculosis from the Beijing clone. Um, you can see virtually 11 and nearly 12,000 SNPs, they all fit a single tree. There are just, um, they're just, these are the only SNPs that don't fit that tree. Again, very, very clear evidence of selection occurring. And you can see drug resistance, but you can also see this SNP. This SNP is not known to underlie drug resistance. It's only ever seen when, um, when one of these RPOB mutations is present. And so we believe this one is a compensation mutation that's giving additional fitness when uh, point mutations occur for rifampicin resistance. We can see, um, see I'll just I'll skip that, but uh, if you look, this is in Clostridium difficile, this is with 151 isolates, about 4,000 SNPs, again, a very, very recent clone of Clostridium difficile, the OG7 clone. You can see, again, very, very few SNPs that don't fit the tree of these 3,500 SNPs. These are the only ones that don't fit the tree after we've removed a few large recombinations. Um, and what we can see is, again, drug resistance, but also, we're starting to see here, um, surface proteins, two component sensor regulators. This is the, product, the major surface protein, SLPA, um, and other membrane proteins. And this is almost certainly evidence of selection by the immune system. So you're getting point mutations, you're getting changes in surface protein, and selection by the immune system. So what, what, what I'm trying to say here is that only by identifying all of the random change and separating out the random mutation from the non-random mutation can you start to identify selection. So you have to separate out, identify all the random change and separate out the non-random change in order to identify that. <coughs> so this is a phylogeny of Streptococcus pneumoniae 23F. Again, 23F is a recent clone. It's probably only 40 or 50 years old. It's also called p one or um, uh, it's, it's an identified multidrug resistant clone that almost certainly arose about 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so we took 250 isolates of this, um, 250 isolates of this clone from around the world and we sequenced all of them when we built the tree um, and this is the tree that we've got from those 250 isolates. And you can immediately see it doesn't look like the tree I showed you earlier. It's a very odd tree we've got. Um, very long external branches, very short internal branches. Um, you've got short external branches and long internal branches. It's a complete mess. Um, and this is a signature of another process that's going on in the genome, homologous recombination. So if you look at where the SNPs are, uh, firstly, if you try and plot root to tip distance uh, against state of isolation, as we did before, you find no relationship at all. There doesn't appear to be any relationship, no clock in the acquisition of the SNPs in the genome, which again is very, very surprising. If you look at the genome and see where these SNPs are, you see two types of SNP. You see the occasional SNP that's occurring randomly around the drug genome, and then you see these very tight clusters of SNPs. So this is a signature of homologous recombination. This is a few kilobases of DNA um, that have come from another strep pneumonia, another, another sequence type of strep pneumonia. It's the same genes in the same location of the chromosome. It's homologous recombination, but it's brought in variation from another part of the chromosome. So you can see that's very, very obvious. It's very clear. Um, and once you know it's there, you can uh, go in and iteratively remove all of those blocks of recombination. And so by separating out the SNPs that have been brought in by recombination with the SNPs that have been acquired by quantitation, you can start to build a tree based just on the SNPs that have arisen by pod mutation, you get a much more robust tree. Um, you get a very strong straight line between um, date of isolation and uh, root to tip distance. These are the non-recombined, the random SNPs, or these are the recombined SNPs. Uh, you get a date, of, a date of origin of this clone around 1970, which fits in with where you know these multi-drug resistant clones arose. We get a mutation rate in the chromosome that matches the mutation rate we saw in Staph aureus. So we're confident that these are the backbone of SNPs, the SNPs that are being introduced by random mutation, which give us the clock, which allow us to look at dates, allow us to date the tree. Um, and all of this is the noise that's being brought in by re recombination. And until you remove 
identify and remove the recombination, separate out those two processes that are causing change in the chromosome. Until you separate out the processes, you can't build that clock. So once you've got the clock, you can, and, and if you've got the clock and you've got the tree, you can bring all of those recombinations back in and overlay them on the tree. You don't throw them away. They're still important information. You just need to see them in context. So each of these colored blocks, this is the genome across the top, um, all the genes uh, laid out by color. Um, these are recombination, blocks of recombination. They're blue if they occur on the terminal branch, they're red if they occur on the internal branch. <coughs> so by overlaying all those recombinations back on the tree, um, we can see where they occur in the genome. Um, and this, across the top here, is a heat map of the frequency of recombination of the chromosome. And you can see it's very, very, um, it's, it's very non-random. Some parts of the chromosome appear to be recombining much more frequently than others. Now that's odd because we know the mechanism of recombination in strep pneumoniae, and we know it in molecular detail, and we know that there is no sequence specificity. Recombination is random. And therefore, if parts of the genome appear to be recombining more frequently, it's actually that those recombinations are more likely to be fixed in the population. And that's going to happen by selection. So what this heat map is, is evidence of selection acting on recombination. Recombination is random, selection acts to keep those recombinations that are beneficial. Um, and you can see that the, the areas of highest recombination are um, surface proteins, PSPA, PSP, uh, these, these are these three are surface proteins, drug resistance locations, uh, a, a phage, this is a, 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 um, this is a transposon that confers drug resistance, this is a phage. And this is the surface capsule. Now, strep pneumonia is, is quite intriguing as an organism because it has 90 different surface polysaccharides, all of which are encoded at a single locus in the chromosome. And it switches its surface polysaccharides by switching in and out the genes of that locus in the chromosome for other versions that exist elsewhere in the species. So this is, a, again, a signature of switching your surface structures, switching your surface polysaccharides and surface proteins almost certainly in response to the human immune system. So this is immune evasion. And again, by separating out the random changes and the recombinational changes, treating them as separate processes and then recombining them, and we can identify the signatures of selection and see which parts of the chromosome are under selection. Um, <coughs> this is looking specifically at these serotypes, which is these surface polysaccharides, which is in strep pneumo. This is the capsular locus, it's about 20 kb, with about 20 or 30 genes. The different capsules are always encoded in this part of the chromosome. To switch the capsule, um, it starts off with a surface polysaccharide called 23F, and it switches to these different ones. All within this tree, these are all switches that occur. Um, this is the block of the chromosome that's recombined to do that. So we can see multiple switches from 23F to 19A to 19F, etc. So this is important because the surface polysaccharide is the target for the vaccine against strep pneumonia. So there's been recently introduced um, a conjugate vaccine called Prevnar, which targets um, seven of those surface polysaccharides. Um, and people are, are bringing out new vaccines that target more of the surface polysaccharides. But we know strep pneumonia, pneumonia as a species has access to 90 different surface polysaccharides. <coughs> so if you vaccinate against the seven more co most common, what happens to the population? Does it switch its capsule or is the population knocked down? So this is um, the, the reason we looked at 23F is because it was one of the components of this new vaccine. So if we look um, at all of the isolates in our tree from, from North America, um, we can see that we have isolates of 23F and 19F, which are both covered by the capsule, and also switches to 19A, which is not covered by the vaccine. Um, and if we look at, within our tree, the dates of these uh, isolation of these strains, we can see that the, the, the vaccine types were isolated mainly before the introduction of the vaccine in the year 2000, and this group of non-vaccine types were, introduced, were, were isolated after the introduction of the vaccine. So it looks quite obvious that if you introduce the vaccine, it switches its capsule uh, and uses a different capsule to avoid the vaccine. 
But we can test that because, <coughs> because of the process we've gone through of uh, getting a really robust tree and getting accurate dating within the tree, really identifying which are the random changes that give us dating, we can date accurately each of the branches within this tree. So we know that this switch from vaccine to non-vaccine capsule must have occurred on this branch. Um, and we can date that branch. <coughs> and we get a date of <coughs> before the introduction of the vaccine. So this capsule switch did not occur in response to the vaccine. The capsule switch had already occurred in the population. The introduction of the vaccine had the effect of actually wiping out the majority of the population and opening up the niche to allow a vaccine switch that had already occurred to, to invade. And that tells us an awful lot about how vaccines work, especially how vaccines work on pneumo and how we should plan vaccine campaigns against strep pneumo. <coughs> right. So we can use this dating also to date transmission. So if we go back to our staff, our staff aureus tree, um, we had colour coding in the tree, and actually the colour coding represents the continent of isolation. Um, and looking at the tree, you can see the base of the tree is red, it's from Europe, and that tells us this multi-drug resistance clone arose in Europe, um, in, in fact, in the late 1960s, and then it spread, there was a single transmission to South America, and then transmissions from South America back into Europe, there was a transmission to Southeast Asia, transmissions from Southeast Asia back into Europe. Now this part of the tree is very, very fine, very dense, and we can actually date these changes. So we can see this strain was apparently isolated in Denmark. It shared a last common ancestor with strains in Thailand within a year and a half. And in fact, this strain was a Thai person who traveled to Denmark, it was taken from a Thai person who traveled to Denmark, uh, and had staff warriors isolated when they were in Denmark. So that is a human transmission within the last year and a half of that. So it ties in our transmission data. We can see this strain here was representative of an outbreak a staph aureus that occurred on an intensive care unit in London. And we could date uh, the introduction into England um, to within at least the last nine years from Southeast Asia. And that will become, uh, <coughs> will become important later on. But it's, it's, it's knowing which of the random changes, building an accurate clock that allows us to make these dating estimates. So I'm going to switch to another organism, to Vibrio cholera. Um, <coughs> and show how we can use um, particularly this ability to date these trees uh, to understand transmission within cholera. So cholera is a really interesting, um, a really interesting disease. Um, it was actually the subject of the first ever epidemiological investigation. Um, so there was a, an outbreak of cholera, as there was frequent outbreaks of cholera in London um, in 1854. Uh, and this, this chap, John Snow, uh, decided to try and find out where the outbreak had come from. Now at that time, this is before Pasteur, this is before Koch, nobody knew that bacteria, nobody knew of the existence of bacteria, and certainly didn't know that they caused disease. And the prevailing theory of, of cholera and plague was the miasma theory that cholera and plague was caused by uh, bad odors in the air, or miasmas. There's a group of people who still believe that, and they're called homeopathists. I would avoid them very much, if you can. Um, so we now know that um, these diseases are caused by bacteria, and John Snow was one of the first people that allowed us to, to look at that. So what he did was he looked at the outbreak uh, and mapped each of these ticks. This is in Soho in, in London. Each tick represents a case of cholera. And he looked at these cases of cholera after putting them on the map, and noticed they all centered around this, which is a, a water pump. Now, being a good epidemiologist, you didn't just to say, well, they're all centered around the water pump, therefore it's coming from the pump, because of course, it could easily have been the bad odor from the water pump. What he showed was that he went and looked for the, for the things that didn't fit the pattern. He found a number of cases of cholera in other parts of London that didn't, that weren't um, close to this pump. And he investigated each case, and in each case, the people who had come down with cholera were getting the water from this pump. There was a, an old lady who lives in the part of London, preferred the taste of the water from this pump and sent her servant out every day to go and get the water from the pump, and she came down with cholera. Um, there were a bunch of school children from different parts of London who all attended the school near here and were drinking the water. So uh, the story goes that John Snow <coughs> persuaded the local people to remove the handle of the pump, and the outbreak went to 
So <clears throat> the first epidemiological inve uh, investigation. But cholera is still a very important disease. Um, it's three, up three, to three, three to five million cases per year with a high mortality rate, which is extremely frustrating because cholera is very, very easy to treat. You don't need to die of cholera. You just need um, oral rehydration, not with water, but with uh, salt solution, salt and sugar solution, intravenous fluids and antibiotics if the disease gets really bad. Um, and actually one of the most effective interventions for cholera is this thing called the Bangkok bed, um, which is effectively just a tarpaulin with a hole in the middle of the bucket on it. Um, and what this means is that uh, it seems very crude, but what it means is firstly, the patient doesn't have to get up and walk around and spread the disease further. And secondly, you can accurately measure the amount of fluid the patient is losing and thereby rehydrate them with the right amount of fluid. And it's an extremely effective intervention. So if you look at the, the organism that causes cholera, it would be a cholera. Um, it's a really, really common organism. You will find it anywhere you go to brackish water off the coast, you will find Vibrio cholera in the water. Uh, there's 200 different serum groups, a hugely diverse species, um, and, and, and you can find it anyway you, you, you look. But what's intriguing is that epidemic cholera appears to be only caused by two out of these 200 serum groups, O1 and O139. O1 is split into two biotypes by a biochemical test, classical and l -tor. So you have an epidemic disease, and cholera is clearly an epidemic disease. It, you, you get epidemics predominantly where you get breakdown in sanitation um, after earthquakes, war, um, other things. Um, so you have an, an odd situation. You have a disease that's clearly epidemic, but also appears to be a response to breakdown in local conditions. Um, so the question is, um, and the underlying question that's sort of uh, driven cholera research is when you have an outbreak of cholera, is it transmitted or is it caused by whatever local strain happens to be in the water? If you look at the history of cholera, as far as you can tell, there were five pandemics since the beginning of the, of, of the 19th century. Um, there was a sixth pandemic, which is well documented from the turn of the century through to about 1923, uh, and we know this was caused by the classical biotype. Um, and that's referred to as the sixth pandemic, and we have samples from that time. There was a gap where there was a, a pandemic free period, and then in the, in the early 60s, there was what's called the seventh pandemic, which arose and spread uh, for about 1961. Um, and if you look at the literature, then uh, more and more variants turn up. People study cholera, they say that there's a, an atypical l tor there's a new hybrid this, and a, a new variant that. All these apparent new types of cholera are turning up. Um, and the question is whether these new variants, this one's a, a capsule switch uh, to 0139, are they new pandemics or are they new variants? So what is the, the, the underlying question is, what, what is the relationship between the disease causing biotypes? Um, and when you get new cholera outbreaks, are they due to local arisals of whatever strain is in the water at the time, or are they due to transmission? Um, so we uh, tried to address this by uh, getting a global collection of 136 new genomes, sequence of 136 genomes from around the world, and combine it with um, about 18 previously published genomes. And we had both l tor the seventh pandemic strains, and classical sixth pandemic strains in there. And this is the tree that we built. Um, and now there are 154 strains on that tree. It really doesn't look like there are 154 strains. And the reason is the vast majority of the strains are in these two tiny little bushes on either end of this. Um, this is the, the seventh pandemic, <coughs> and this is the classical one. Well. So what this represents, all these sporadic few strains represent the broad diversity of the cholera species. And these two tiny clusters represent the epidemic, the sixth pandemic and the seventh pandemic strains. And what it shows you is that they are single occurrences, single arisals of epidemic strains and, and independent arisals. Something has happened independently that led to the classical O1s and to the O139s. It may be as simple as the acquisition of the cholera toxin. The cholera toxin sits on a, on a bacteriophage and you know it can come in from the chromosome. Two independent events that led to these two, um, uh, two pandemic clones. So we concentrated now just on the seventh pandemic. Now there's very, very little variation in the chromosome. Uh, 
only about maximum 250 SNPs between any two pairs. So it's a very, very recent clone. Um, and if we plot data isolation again against root to tip distance, we see a very, very strong straight line, which tells us, as we've seen before, that most of these mutations are random and we're getting a very accurate plot rate from this random mutation. There's one strain that sits out here. We're not quite sure whether it's a hypermutator or whether it's just a heavy capacitive lab strain. But we do have strains going back to the 1940s, the 1930s, which gives us again this very long time period relative to the depth of the tree, which is what gives us really accurate data within the tree. So we can take these strains um, and we can build a dated tree. This, this um, tree is, is, is built with a, a Bayesian software called Beast which um, measures the, the dates on all the tips um, and infers the dates of the nodes inside those tips. So it's, it's inferring the dates that further down the tree. These, these tools, uh, these Bayesian analysis tools, were actually developed for viruses because viruses have a very high mutation rate and people assumed actually that it was only viruses that you were going to be able to see evolution working and get data trees. And I think a lot of the virologists were quite surprised when they found there's actually enough variation in these clones of bacteria to do the same kind of data analysis. So what we can see is this is just the El, the El Tor tree. We can see that the earliest um, split in the El Tor tree dates roughly to the turn of the century, which, um, which ties in with the first identification of El Tor in um, uh, the, first, uh, the first identification of El Tor strain. And then you can see an expansion of the tree starting around here, dated to around the early 1950s, which ties in with the origin of the tree <coughs> and the expansion of the El Tor in the seventh <coughs> If you try and cluster these strains, you come up with three clear clusters, and the three clear clusters have got separate um, dates. There's an early cluster, a middle cluster, and a late cluster. Um, and the origins of these um, the last common ancestor between these clusters are marked down here. <coughs> now, if we overlay on top of this the location information, the place in the world where these strains came from, um, we can start to get an idea of how the transmission occurs. So this is, again, a dated tree. If we look at, for example, the African strains in this tree, you see some African strains here that are part of this first cluster. Um, this represents an outbreak in Africa. The outbreak comes to an end. There's a second outbreak in Africa here. And what you can see is that these strains are not directly, uh, they're not coming from these strains, they're not directly uh, descended from these earlier strains in Africa. They're actually coming back from the roots of the tree. And you see that and that outbreak occurs, it dies out. There's a third outbreak in Africa up here. Um, again, the African outbreak strains are not directly descended from the previous two outbreaks in Africa, they come back from the root of the tree. If you look at the strains of the root of the tree, all the way down the tree, they're from South Asia, specifically around the Bay of Bengal. You can see the same thing here in South America. You can see some strains in South America, uh, an outbreak, a second outbreak here that's unrelated to the first. Um, and you can see the same in Vietnam and Malaysia, uh, two, three, one, two, three outbreaks, all part of um, individual groups uh, and not derived from the earlier strains. So what it tells you is that... <coughs> 80, 80 is up. Yeah, these are the Haitian ones up here. This red one was just falling off the top. <coughs> so we'll come on to Haiti. <laughs> so what it tells you is that the ongoing evolution of this strain is occurring in one place in um, South Asia and the epidemics are seeded from that um, ongoing evolution. We've got three waves, and if we plot them on a, on a map, we can see um, transmission, uh, and we can date, because we have both the date and the location, we can date each of the transmissions between countries. We can see transmissions into Europe, into the Middle East, into Africa, um, into Southeast Asia. If this is in the first wave, and then from Africa into South America. Um, we can see, as part of the second and third waves, again, transmissions from uh, the Bay of Bengal through into Southeast Asia, through into Africa, through here. Uh, this is the Haitian strain as part of the third wave. 
So we can see that um, contrary to the idea that whenever a breakdown in, in sanitation occurs, the local strain of cholera causes the outbreak, outbreaks are almost always caused by strains that have been transmitted from the Bay of Bengal. Now it's likely that um, within the Bay of Bengal there's ongoing local transmission, that there's ongoing um, outbreaks that are caused by local environmental changes, uh, but in the rest of the world it's almost always strains that are seeded from the Bay of Bengal. So what changes underlie this? Why, why, does it, why does this first wave die out and the second wave replace it? Well, the one switch that's very, very clear is that at this point in the tree, all of these strains, virtually all of these strains downstream are multidrug resistant. So it appears that they've acquired multidrug resistance at this point, um, and that has allowed strain replacement of new strains to spread out. Um, Now we can investigate that because all of the multidrug resistance is due to a single element in the chromosome. And the element is called SXT. It's a self-mobile conjug conjugative element. It's quite large. It's about 60 kb in size. These are all of these 154 strains. This is the SXT element, just that element in the chromosome. The regions that are very present here in white are the drug resistance determinants. The regions in blue that are present in all the strains are the conjugative apparatus, the bit that makes the thing move around. Now, that 60 kb is enough that we can build a phylogenetic tree of the element separately from the chromosome. So we can pull the element out and say, what's the evolutionary history of this element? Is it the same as the chromosome, or is it different? And actually, it's completely different. Um, it has a completely different structure than the tree. You can see very, very tight clusters separated by deep branches. And even more importantly, these deep branches are much, much longer than the branches in the chromosome. The SNP rate in the SXT element is 100 times more than the SNP rate in the chromosome. That doesn't mean it's mutating faster, it means it's older. It's 100 times older than the chromosome of the LTOR region. So these are, these are just LTORs. And if you look at, at that, each of those different types and put them on the tree, you can see that actually, rather than there being a single acquisition of SXT here, you've got multiple introdu introductions of different SXTs that are much older than the chromosome. So you can see the evolutionary history of the mobile elements separate to the chromosome. You can see they're coming in and out multiple times from another pool, probably a broader Vibrio polar species, where these things are circulating uh, and independently coming multiple times into the L tour. So this becomes really interesting. Because it's this mobile element and others like it, the, the, the phage that carries the cholera toxin, the phage associated with it, that are currently used as <coughs> cholera. So if you, if you look at the cholera tree and you look at the mobile elements, you can see lots of mobile elements coming in and out, different branches of the tree. Um, and if you plot them back onto the tree, these are the mobile elements in chromosome 1, chromosome 2, this is the SXT element, uh, and these are the variants. Um, so these are the cholera toxin phage, these are the associated phage and some other elements. And you can see that they don't match the tree. There's evidence that they're coming in and out independently. Um, so what that means, if you use these mobile elements, the cholera toxin, the RSR, and others, to type cholera, you see diversity. You see novel types, you see novel hybrids, you see new things coming in. It doesn't tell you about the evolutionary history of the organism. What tells you about the evolutionary history is the core genome. These organisms are bacteria, they're dividing by binary fission, and they're spreading by movement from place to place. And therefore, if you want to trace the transmission of the organism, you need to look at the core chromosome and not at the mobile elements. So the mobile elements will give you a completely different idea of the evolutionary history, as with the SXT. So one of the reasons that people see so much diversity in cholera is because they're looking in the wrong place. They're looking at the diverse elements and not at the core. And again, it comes back to what I said at the beginning. If you want to understand selection, you want to understand transmission, you need to identify all the different processes that are going on in the chromosome, separate them out, treat them independently, and only then will you understand how they all interact. So, to come round to Haiti. So, Haiti's been a, 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 an unstable country, or certainly a very poor country for a long time. Um, 
and there's been a, a United Nations presence in Haiti since 2004. In 2010, there was a, 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 an incredibly severe earthquake that uh, caused very large numbers of deaths. Um, and in response to this, the UN sent additional troops from Nepal to Haiti in September. In October, cholera appeared in Haiti. There had been no cholera in Haiti for 100 years. And by February 2011, there had been more than 4,500 deaths, 300,000 people infected. And that number has continued to rise. I think it's now more than 7,500 deaths. So this brings us back to our question of where does cholera come from? Is it a local strain in the water? Is the earth, is it an you know, earthquake causes a breakdown in sanitation? The local strains that are circulating in the water cause an outbreak of cholera? Or is it introduced? Has it been transmitted from elsewhere? Well, the first thing we can do is look at where the cholera, um, look at where the cholera cases occurred and when. We can go all the way back to John Snow in 1850 and draw a map of the cholera cases. Uh, these are all the early cholera deaths in green. Uh, and if you look at the dating of those cholera deaths, there's a clear um, increase in data, increase in time from the top of this river, the Artibonite River, down. The camp where the Nepalese peacekeeping soldiers were is just here, adjacent to where the first death occurred. Um, and there was evidence that uh, there was a breakdown of sanitation in the camp. So even without any molecular biology at all, it's the, 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 the best guess from the epidemiology is that the cholera outbreak actually didn't start from a local horizon in the, in the coastal waters, it started from an event that occurred at the UN camps and then spread downstream. Now, if you go back to our tree and look where the Haitian strains are, the Haitian strains are here. They're completely embedded within lots and lots of recent strains from um, Southeast Asia. Uh, from, uh, well, we can't be more accurate than that. So from this tree, we can use our dating, we can say that the Haitian strains last shared a common ancestor with strains from Southeast Asia within the last, I think, six years from this tree. Um, so it means that if it was in the local water, it can't have been there very long. But your ability to trace the origin is entirely dependent on the context. Um, we can, you know, and we didn't actually have any strains from the pool, so we couldn't directly compare it to contemporary strains, strains from the same year in Nepal, and therefore we couldn't definitively say that it came there. But we could say from this tree that it clearly wasn't a local Haitian isolate. That it clearly been introduced at some point. So in order to, um, to make that more accurate, we would need to go to Nepal and sample strains from Nepal around the, time, uh, around the same time. And this is what a, a group in, um, in Denmark did. Um, published this uh, last year, um, and they sequenced strains from 2001 from Nepal, from these different areas of Nepal. This is the tree, it's now a very, very fine tree because you're looking at strains that are extremely close related, and the Haitian strains are here, and they are actually identical strains from Nepal, from this area of Nepal specifically, where the United Nations peacekeepers came from. So it's fairly unambiguous that and this, using this tree uh, and using the data that we have, you can say that the, the strain that caused the mass of the outbreak in, in, the, in Haiti shared a common ancestor with the strains that were circulating in the poor within six months before the outbreak. So it seems very, very clear that that strain had been introduced from, the, from this area. Now, that seems conclusive, but um, Again, it's, a, it's something that needs to be interpreted with caution because, of course, this black line is something that we draw on the map. People love drawing lines on maps. And bacteria don't, don't read maps, and they certainly don't look at lines and take notes of them. And this isn't a big blank part of the world, it's India. And there's lots and lots of people living there. And almost certainly, if this strain is circulating in Nepal, it's probably circulating in the north of India and possibly other areas as well. So you can exclude transmission, you can say absolutely this was not a local strain from Haiti. Uh, and you can say that it almost certainly came from somewhere in South Asia, somewhere around the Bay of Nepal, within this date. But you can't go and say it was from there. Um, so what does this allow us to do? Well, it means that if we want to understand the local evolution of cholera, we want to understand how it, what, what selective pressures it's under, how cholera is evolving, 
we know where to look. It's happening there in the Bay of Bengal, and that's where we need to be sampling and investigating it to look at what pressures are driving it. And we've now got the tools that allow us to differentiate sporadic um, epidemic outbreaks from endemic evolution. Um, and using the fine genetic evolution, genetic analysis, um, we can really start to build these, these accurate transmission maps. Uh, and therefore, when there are future outbreaks, given the background context we already have, we rapidly say where that strain has come from and how it got there. <coughs> okay, one final example of how we can use this transmission on a much, much finer scale. And I'm going to talk about Staph aureus. So Staph aureus, we talked about before. Staph aureus is actually a widespread, um, it's a widespread uh, component of the natural biota. When people think of it as a pathogen, but of course it's not a pathogen, it's a commensal. Most people carry it, a third of the population will carry Staph aureus. Um, it very, very rarely causes disease, usually causes diseases on people that are otherwise compromised, but it can cause a very nasty range of diseases when it does get in the wrong place. Um, it's important because it's increasingly acquired resistance to, to drugs, particularly methicillin. Um, now, again, MRSA we think of as one of these dreadful diseases you catch in hospital. 1% of people carry MRSA normally most of the time without causing disease. So uh, 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 a few of you in this room will almost certainly be carrying MRSAs on your skin or on your nerves. And it's almost very, very unlikely to cause disease. If we look um, over the last 20 years, there was an epidemic of MRSAs within UK hospitals. Um, starting from the 90s, this bar graph is the proportion of MRSAs within the hospital. And you can see the proportion of MRSAs of Staph aureus shot up. Um, about this time, the government noticed and decided it needed to bring down the rate of MRSA and introduced mandatory hand washing and other targets um, that brought down the, the rate of MRSA in the hospital. This is the absolute number of bacteremias now uh, coming down. Um, there's still too many, and we still want to prevent MRSA infections, particularly MRSA bacteremias occurring in hospitals. Um, but the problem is that MRSA is a common organism. And if you have a large hospital, people will constantly be bringing MRSA into the hospital. So if you want to work out whether you've got an outbreak in your hospital, you need to differentiate the strains that people are constantly bringing in from strains that are transmitted in the hospital. And that's actually particularly difficult because all of this, virtually all of this expansion of MRSA in the UK and also in North America and other parts of the world was down to two clones, the MRSA 15 and the MRSA 16. And these clones are not distinguishable by normal typing technologies. You can, you can sometimes see differences in antibiotic resistance pattern but if you try multilocal sequence typing, uh, PFG mostly, very, very little variation. So you can't tell the difference. If you have two patients in the same ward with MRSA, mostly you can't tell the difference between them. You can't say whether they brought them independently or whether they transmitted it. Um, so this is where we think whole genome sequencing gives us sufficient resolution. You saw at the beginning that a single sequence type of MRSA does have a huge amount of variation within it. Um, and it acquires SNPs around six SNPs per year. So there is enough resolution to start differentiating strains. And even more importantly, we now have new sequencing technologies that allow us to sequence very, very rapidly. Um, so we think that we can start to um, sequence routinely all MRSA we do in the hospital. In fact, we're now doing that within our local hospital. We're sequencing every single MRSA as they go through the hospital. Every patient that's false positive for MRSA is sequenced. So we wanted to show that our sequencing-based typing would give better resolution and more accuracy than the standard typing. So we looked at an outbreak of MRSA that had occurred in, on the special care baby unit in our local hospital. Um, and we first had a we, we chose this outbreak, it had happened six months before we did the analysis. We chose this outbreak because the infection control team at the time couldn't say whether it was an outbreak or not. They really weren't sure. Um, what happened was three babies showed up with um, MRSA at the same time. And this triggered an investigation 
and the infection control team looked backwards um, and found a number of other babies that had MRSA on the same ward previously, and actually as they were doing the investigation, another baby turned up with that MRSA. And they looked at it, and they couldn't say that it was an outbreak. They couldn't be sure, because there were gaps in the transmission chain where there was no MRSA on the ward, and some of the early strains had a different antibiotic pattern, antibiotic resistance pattern. So they did what they needed to do, they deep cleaned the ward, they, they put in place enhanced control procedures, um, and they thought that if it was an outbreak, they brought it to a close. So we took these strains because, um, because they were a good test. You know, we could say, were they an outbreak or not? We could, be, we, we could test our uh, technology. So we, we sequenced all of these strains and we built a tree. Now each of these concentric circles represents one SNP difference. So two and a half million base pair chromosome, one base pair change. And we're confident that we can accurately call those single base pair changes. Um, so you can see that these are all part of an outbreak. They're clearly very, very tightly related, uh, and they're all related to each other. So we asked the first question. This was clearly an outbreak. So we then decided to see whether this outbreak had spread any further. So the local hospital, the, the microbiology department, also deals with the whole hospital, and it deals with uh, local, um, local doctors as well. And we pulled out every MRSA from the hospital and from other doctors in the, in the area at the same time, we checked those that had the similar antibiotic resistance pattern in the sequence, there were 20 of them, um, and we saw there were a number of others um, that when we sequenced them, oops, when we sequenced them were clearly again part of the SAM outbreak. So most of these were, some of these were in the hospital, some of these were in the, in the community. Uh, and when we looked for links between these people, we found that every single one of them could be linked back to the special care baby. Uh, for example, this man here was a partner of this woman here. This woman was on the same ward as this woman. This woman had a baby on the special care baby. All of these people had previously swapped negative for MRSA, but subsequently became positive. Um, and you can see that chain of transmission. This was a partner of this woman who had a baby on the special care baby. In each case, we could see the links. And if you look, for example, at this baby to the mother to the partner, you could see the direct links in the tree. So we'd seen that the epidemic had spread further. Um, so we'd gone from a retrospective analysis, looking at this outbreak, to a prospective analysis, trying to find out um, whether, it, whether it had spread further. But we were still looking at historical isolates. And then the, um, the people on the, 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 the infection control team on the ward said, um, there's a new baby on the ward with MRSA. And now there's been a two month gap between this baby and the last baby that was positive. Um, so previously, it would have been discounted. There's no way this was part of the outcome um, because there's too large a gap. So we sequenced this baby. Within, 20, within 48 hours of a positive swab, we had the sequence analyzed and we put it back in the tree. So 24 hours to grow the strain on the plate, 24 hours to do the sequence and analysis. And we went back to the hospital and we said, this baby is clearly part of the outbreak. Um, and because you've got this huge gap and because of the other things going on the ward, it's almost certain that somebody on that ward is carrying this MRSA strain. And so we took this data to the infection control team and they took it to all the staff on the ward and all the staff on the ward volunteered to be screened for MRSA. 154 staff were all swabbed for MRSA. One of them was positive. Um, now that's not uncommon, it's not surprising. 1% of people carry MRSA, so that's not surprising. So we sequenced, again, within 48 hours of that swab from the, from the, uh, from the hospital worker, uh, we sequenced that. Um, and we showed, actually we sequenced 20 strains from that hospital worker, because we assumed that they'd been carrying it a while and there might be some diversity. And those 20 strains formed a cloud within the tree. And most clearly, the early strains matched the strains from before this gap, and the later strains matched the strain from after the gap. So we could say fairly conclusively that this healthcare worker had been responsible for carrying the strain across this large gap. When we looked at the date of the last common ancestor of the strains, just the strains that the healthcare worker was carrying, the date of the last common ancestor was about before, just about the start of the outbreak with really large confidence intervals. This dotted line is the confidence interval. 
So we can be fairly confident that the healthcare worker was involved in carrying on the outbreak. It's possible, but we can't say for certain, that they were involved in the earliest part of the outbreak. So the hospital worker was taken off the ward, they were decolonised and allowed to go back to work, and this happened in last January, there's been no further outbreak of this strain on that ward. So we think that this is the first time that real-time sequencing has actually led to a, a medical intervention that's brought an outbreak to a close. Now, I've talked about this as if it was all carriage. It wasn't. All, this, all the babies on the ward turned out positive because they were routinely swapped. Um, but the patients in the, in the community had all come into the hospital. They all come into the hospital because they had um, usually abscesses, breast abscesses, leg abscesses, ear abscesses. Uh, and they'd had MRSA taken from those and swapped. So actually this wasn't a simple carriage. And when we went back and looked at the hospital records, we found that several of these babies had actually been discharged with superficial pustules. And it wasn't simple carriage at all. And it turns out that this strain, we were, actually we learned very early as soon as we did sequencing, this strain carries an extra toxin, the pantin valentine leucocidin, that's associated with skin and soft tissue infection in community acquired Staph aureus. So this wasn't a simple MRSA carriage, this was a, a highly virulent Staph aureus that's associated with multi drug resistance. So, just briefly, how much longer have I got? Do you want me to? Five minutes, you can do three minutes and we can have So, ten minutes. two things. Firstly, this outbreak was first picked up here. If we had been doing routine sequencing, if we'd been sequencing every positive swab in the hospital, as it happened, we would have spotted the outbreak here and we would have been able to prevent all of that downstream. And this, just the simple clinical consequences, cost, cost at least £10,000 just for the treatment. So we think that by routine sequencing, you can stop these outbreaks occurring before, before they spread. So this is actually a group of, um, this is ST22, which is MSA15. Um, we had at the same time we'd been doing a large global study of ST22 of about 500 isolates, 200 isolates. Um, and we could split ST22 up into these, which were the hospital-acquired um, epidemic strains and some more broader community-acquired strains. Now, I have a nice tree of these, and we can look to see what happened on these branches that led to this enormous spread of hospital-acquired MRSA of this particular epidemic. It wasn't methicillin resistance, because methicillin resistance comes in multiple times on this tree. I'm going to get the hang of this before I stop talking. Um, <coughs> If we look on this tree, we can see actually that the few changes that occurred on this branch that separates out the epidemic ones from the community ones is fluoroquinolone resistance. And it appears that fluoroquinolone resistance um, may well have been the trigger that allowed this organism to become an epidemic MRSA as opposed to the community acquired MRSA that it was previously. Um, now we can date this, and we get a really accurate dating of when this fluoroquinolone resistance arose. And it arose in uh, the, late, the early 1980s. Um, we can also do our phylogeographic reconstruction and we can say when, if we trace back the roots of transmission, trace them back and back, we can see when this strain arose. And it arose in um, the West Midlands, in a small in a part of England around Birmingham and Nottinghamshire, in the late 19, in the early 1980s, and then it spread worldwide. Uh, and this is really intriguing because this was before the introduction of fluoroquinolones into clinical practice. So, what was going on in the West Midlands at that time? What was going on were a number of clinical trials into the use of uh, ciprofloxacin as fluoroquinolone. So, it appears that this organism acquired fluoroquinolone resistance in response to the early clinical trials that were going on in the West Midlands. It sat around there for a while, and then as fluoroquinolone resistance spread, this organism spread with it. Around. As fluoroquinolone use was spread, this organism spread with it. So, um, that's enough, I think. Um, clearly, I didn't do all this on my own. Um, there's a huge number of people that were involved in this work. Uh, particularly, the Staff Warriors work was done by Matt Holden, the Staff Numo was Nick Croucher, um, what else did I talk about? Anyway, um, 
the big red collar work was done by Anthony Trojan. Um, and these global collections rely on large um, groups of, of collaborators who collaborate on, on bringing the strains um, on the analysis of the data and without whom you couldn't do any of this work. Uh, and these are some of those people uh, and welcome trusted funders. So I'm very interested here in, in the color of study sense. So the guy who makes the epidemiological investigation in IT for Marseille. So yes. Uh, uh, it's a one of the people in IT. It's a, it's a big, uh, very interesting, it's a big, it's a big ideological fight between people saying that it comes from the environment yeah. and it comes from the eating of the planet and it comes from a meal yeah. uh, and so on. And that was very, very strong. And it's and not finished yet. Yeah. It's not finished yet. Yeah. And when we send the paper to the Lancet, so the paper was very clearly describing the epidemiology and so on, they don't even send it out for review. And it, this was was published later, Emerging Infectious yeah. Disease. But they, they didn't want even to see that. And interestingly, at the same time, they accept a paper on the prediction by modelization of what cholera is going to be, which never happens because prediction never worked. But it was so, it was you know, very, very interesting. It was the same story. And I wrote them, you, you are always wrong with cholera. You were wrong with snow. You know, they tried to kill us. Yeah. And when you wrote that in the 19th century, that's said they tried to kill us. I said, you are always wrong with cholera. It is a very political field. Uh, it is a very political field. And, uh, and that does oh, distort yeah. the science. And all the other years show what's claiming this was not true because they don't want the unit in nation to be involved, of course, because uh, this was the I think you know, it's, been, it's been obvious that for some time from several different strands, but I think the epidemiology, absolutely. I mean, the epidemiology itself, but, but the, the molecular biology makes it so clear. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, Holo believes that they, they have to release, you know, it was in the pack all the facets. And he, he, he thinks that to get such an outbreak, they have to release probably one uh, cubic meter of. Yeah. at the same time to get such an attack rate. <laughs> I think probably people were sick and not saying anything. Uh, in, in this was really important. Another question? Yeah. Um, I have two questions on the degree. On the first one is when you look at the chromosome and evolution, is it the same uh, phenomenon for the, for the two chromosomes? We didn't differentiate between the two chromosomes. There's more mobile elements on the second yes. one. But, but in the core, we didn't separate. <coughs> and my, my second question is, um, like S60 locus, did you look at this for the whole antigen locus that is believed to be no gist content as compared to the Yeah, genome? so um, so we have evidence that the 0139, um, on, on the tree, the 0139 is a novel acquisition. You can see where it arises. Um, and you can see clearly that the 0139 is derived from the 01s just by the switch of the antigen. So you can see, but, but I think we didn't build a tree of the O1 to see if it's the same. I, I would see it as the same as the present. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Did, you, did you sequence from the area? You sequence only strains from patients or also from the environment? There are some environmental strains in there, but they're, they're difficult to so, so if you look at that broad tree, some of the ones that are spread around the tree are environmental. But we have a large project now in Bangladesh looking at um, longitudinal samples from the same location all the time. So we should be able to answer some questions about the relationship. I think part of the problem is that almost in Bangladesh uh, and in the Bay of Bengal, common outbreaks are driven by the local environment. Um, and I think that's where that early work was done and, and, and it holds there. It doesn't, it doesn't hold when you try and explain it to the rest of the world. Yes? Uh, well, the, the technical question is about that. I mean, how, what kind of sequencing technology did you use and or did you do as well as the fishing process for genome bacteria genome stuff? So all of this is done on Illumina. Illumina is And the finishing process? We don't do any finishing. Any finishing. So, um, 
So part of the reason is um, that it's too expensive. And if we want to look at large populations, we have to accept we're going to lose some information. Because what we're really interested in is, is, is the, the core that gives us the underlying phylogeny. Mm -hmm. So we do two things. We, um, we tend to map sequences. We find a, a good reference, and we have a lot of good references, and we map them, the, the reads to the core to call variants. Now that's extremely accurate. We're, we're confident that our false positive rate is below one per genome. So it's, it's very, very accurate. And that gives us that, that robust phylogeny. What we then do is um, we do a process of building the pan genome where we do de novo assemblies. We map to the reference genome, we identify everything novel, we put that into a pan genome, we map the next one, identify anything novel, put it into the pan genome, and we can then build up the pan genome. So once you have the core, you can overlay on top of it all the novel sequences and assemble them separately. So we have a process. But, um, you know, finishing is something that was very necessary, I think, when sequencing was based on cloning in E. coli, because the gaps tended to be quite large, you got whole genes missing. I think our analysis of, of certainly short read sequencing is because there's no cloning process, there's no cloning bias. And unless something goes seriously wrong with the sequencing, which it does sometimes, your representation of the chromosome is very, very high. So you will lose perfect repeats, and you may lose other highly repetitive genome sequences, but the representation of coding sequence is almost complete. And as long as you can cope with the fact that it's not all joined together, then, then you don't need to go through that process of friction. Okay. Yeah, uh, the last question yes, on the staff or this project is the same mutation. Did you obtain some strength with uh, SNPs? The mutation in DNA mismatch would not yeah, what, what is the evolution of the not in Staph aureus, but we have seen in other trees. Um, actually, actually, no, I lied. In, in, not in that tree, but in another analysis we did of Staph aureus, it was again an outbreak analysis in the hospital where we sequenced um, 12 or so strains. And one of them, most of the strains were three or four snips different, and the other strain was 30 snips different. Um, and although it was 30 snips different, it was clearly by the phylogeny rooted within the same cluster. So it was part of the outbreak. <coughs> if you had just said, you know, more than two snips, more than five snips is not linked, you know, 30 snips is clearly not linked. But if you build a phylogeny, you can see that it's linked to the cluster. And when we looked at the genome, it had a point mutation in nut S. So it was clearly a mismatch with that. So we do see hypermutators arising. Thank you very much.